Good evening and welcome again to Free to Choose from the Barber Surgeons Hall here in the City of London. This is the fifth of a series of six programmes debating and challenging the economic philosophy of the noted American economist and Nobel Prize winner, Professor Milton Friedman. And I have here with me in front of an invited audience of economists, consumer affairs specialists and others interested in Professor Friedman's views, a three-man panel consisting of the Right Honourable Roy Hattersley, the former Secretary of State for Prices and Consumer Protection in the Labour Government, Mr. Saxon Tate, the Managing Director of Tate & Lyle, and Mr. Charles Medawar of Social Audit. They'll have an opportunity to challenge Professor Friedman face-to-face -face about his ideas, and in particular, I suspect, about his conviction that the consumers would be better off if they had not, over the decades, been protected, as they were supposed to be, by governments and by parliaments, both in the United States and Britain, from the alleged unscrupulousness or possible irresponsibility of big business and not so big business. But first, as always, we start with a personal statement by Professor Friedman on film of his conviction, and he asked the question, who protects the consumer? The 1960s Corvair, condemned by Ralph Nader as unsafe at any speed. Since Nader's attack, it's being increasingly accepted that we need government protection in the marketplace. Today, there are agencies all over Washington where bureaucrats decide what's good for us. Agencies to control the prices we pay, the quality of goods we can buy, the choice of products available. It's already costing us more than $5 billion a year. Since the attack on the Corvair, government has been spending more and more money in the name of protecting the consumer. This is hardly what the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, whose monument this is, had in mind when he defined a wise and frugal government as one which restrains men from injuring each other and leaves them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement. Ever since the Corvair affair, the U.S. government has increasingly been muscling in between buyer and seller in the marketplaces of America. By Thomas Jefferson's standards, what we have today is not a wise and frugal government, but a spendthrift and snooping government. The federal regulations that govern our lives are available in many places. One set is here, in the Library of Congress, in Washington, D.C. In 1936, the federal government established the Federal Register to record all of the regulations, hearings, and other matters connected with the agencies in Washington. This is volume one, number one. In 1936, it took three volumes like this to record all these matters. In 1937, it took four. And then it grew and grew and grew. At first, rather slowly and gradually, but even so, year by year, it took a bigger and bigger pile to hold all the regulations and hearings for that year. Then, around 1970, came a veritable explosion, so that one pile is no longer enough to hold the regulations for that year. It takes two and then three piles, until on one day in 1977, September 28th, the Federal Register had no fewer than 1,754 pages. And these aren't exactly what you would call small pages either. Many of those regulations come from this building. Consumer Product Safety Airlines are busy. Would you hold, please? Thank you. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is one of the newest agencies set up on our behalf. Coil. May I help you? One of its jobs is to give advice to consumers. Uh, the cue that gave it away is that uh, those that are involved... And what has been done about the flammability of children's garments? But its main function is to produce rules and regulations, hundreds and hundreds of them, designed to assure the safety of products on the market. It's hard to escape the visible hand of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Except for food and drugs, ammunition and automobiles, which are covered by other agencies, 
It has power to regulate just about anything you can imagine. Already, it costs $41 million a year to test and regulate all these products on our behalf. And that's just the beginning. The commission employs highly trained technicians to carry out tests like this, checking the brakes on a bike. But the fact is that 80% of bike accidents are caused by human error. These tests may one day lead to safer brakes, but even that isn't sure. The one thing that is sure is that the regulations that come out of here will make bikes more expensive and will reduce the variety available. Yes, they really are testing how matches strike. And the tests are very precise. The pressure must be exactly one pound. The match exactly at right angles. Consumer Product Safety Commission. No matter how many tests are done, children's swings are never going to be totally safe. You cannot outlaw accidents. If you try, you end up with ludicrous results. It hardly seems possible, but they really do use highly skilled people to devise regulations that will prevent toy guns from making too big a bang. Consumer product safety. The commission, in effect, is deciding what they think is good for us. They are taking away our freedom to choose. Consumers don't have to be hemmed in by rules and regulations. They're protected by the market itself. They want the best possible products at the lowest price. And the self-interest of the producer leads him to provide those products in order to keep customers satisfied. After all, if they bring goods of low quality here, you're not going to keep coming back to buy them. If they bring goods that don't serve your needs, you're not going to buy them. And therefore, they search out all over the world the products that might meet your needs and might appeal to you. And they stand in back of them, because if they don't, they're going to go out of business. You see the difference between the market and the political action, the governmental agency. Here, nobody forces you. You're free. You do what you want to. There's no policeman to take money out of your pocket or to make sure that you do what you're told to. Over a quarter of a century ago, I bought secondhand a desk calculator for which I paid $300. One of these little calculators today, which I can buy for $10 or so, will do everything that did and more beside. What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? It was self-interest, or if you prefer, greed. The greed of producers who wanted to produce something that they can make a dollar on. The greed of consumers who wanted to buy things as cheaply as they could. Did government play a role in this? Very little. Only by keeping the road clear for human greed and self-interest to promote the welfare of the consumer. When governments do intervene in business, innovation is stifled. <laughs> Railroads have been regulated for nearly a century, and they are one of our most backward industries. The railroad story shows what so often results from the good intentions of consumer protection groups. In the 1860s, railroad rates were lower in the United States than anywhere else in the world. But many customers thought that they were too high. They complained bitterly about the profits of the railroads. Now, the railway men of the time had their problems, too. Problems that arose out of the fierce competitiveness among them. Many railroads all trying to get their share of the market, all trying to make a name for themselves. If you want to see what their problems were as they saw them, come and have a look at this. From inside this private railroad car, it may not look as if the people who ran the railroads had any real problems. Some, like the owner of this private car, had done very well. This was the equivalent of the private jets of today's business tycoons. But for each one who succeeded, Many didn't survive the cutthroat competition. What we have here 
is a railroad map of the United States for the year 1882. It shows every railroad then in existence. The country was literally crisscrossed with railroads, going to every remote hamlet and covering the nation from coast to coast. Between points far distant, like, for example, New York and Chicago, there might be a half a dozen lines that would be running between those two points. Each of the half dozen trying to get business would cut rates, and rates would get very low. The people who benefited most from this competition were the customers shipping goods on a long trip. On the other hand, between some segments of that trip, say, for example, Harrisburg and Pittsburgh, there might be only a single line that was running, and that line would take full advantage of its monopoly position. It would charge all that the traffic would bear. The result was that the sum of the fares charged for the short hauls was typically larger than the total sum charged for the long haul between the two distant points. Of course, none of the consumers complained about the low price for the long haul, but the consumers certainly did complain about the higher prices for the short hauls, and that was one of the major sources of agitation leading ultimately to the establishment of the Interstate Commerce Commission. The cartoonists of the day delighted in pointing out that railroads had tremendous political influence, as indeed they did. They used the consumers' complaints to get the government to establish a commission that would protect the railroads' interests. It took about a decade to get the commission into full operation. By that time, needless to say, the consumer advocates had moved on to their next crusade. But the railway men were still there. They had soon learned how to use a commission to their own advantage. They solved the long-haul, short-haul problem by raising the long-haul rates. The customers ended up paying more, some protection. The first commissioner was Thomas Cooley, a lawyer who had represented the railroads for many years. The railroads continued to dominate the commission. In the 1920s and 30s, when trucks emerged as serious competitors for long-distance hauling, the railroads induced the commission to extend control over trucking. Truckers, in their turn, learned how to use a commission to protect themselves from competition. This firm carries freight to and from the Dayton, Ohio International Airport. It's the only one serving some routes, and its customers depend on it. But Dayton Air Freight has real problems. Its ICC license only permits it to carry freight from Dayton to Detroit. To serve other routes, it's had to buy rights from other ICC license holders, including one who doesn't own a single truck. It's paid as much as $100,000 a year for the privilege. Our company is in the process of trying to get rights to go there now. Yes, we'll do that. And thank you for calling, sir. The owners of the firm have been trying for years to get their license extended to cover more routes. As far as I'm concerned, there is no free enterprise in interstate commerce. It no longer exists in this country. Uh, you have to pay the price, and you have to pay the price very dearly. And that not only means that we have to pay the price, it means that the consumer is paying that price. The price consumers pay when it comes to medicine could be their lives. In the 19th century, pharmacies contained an impressive array of pills and potions. Most were ineffective and some were deadly. There was an outcry about drugs that maimed or killed. The Food and Drug Administration, in response to consumer pressure, succeeded in banning a whole range of medicines. The tonics and lotions with their excessive claims disappeared from the market. In 1962, the Kefauver Amendments gave the FDA power to regulate all drugs for effectiveness as well as for safety. Today, every drug marketed in the United States must pass the FDA. It's clear that this has protected us from some drugs with horrific side effects, like thalidomide. And we all know of people who have benefited from modern drugs. What we don't hear much about, however, are the beneficial drugs that the FDA has prohibited. Well, if you examine uh, the therapeutic significance of 
drugs that haven't arrived in the U.S. Uh, but are available somewhere in the rest of the world, such as in Britain, you can uh, come across numerous examples where the patient has suffered. For example, there are one or two um, drugs called beta blockers, which uh, it now appears can prevent death after a heart attack. We call this secondary prevention of uh, coronary death after myocardial infarction, uh, which, if available here, could be saving um, about 10,000 lives a year in the United States. In the 10 years after the 1962 amendments, no drug was approved for hypertension, that's for the control of blood pressure, in the United States, whereas several were approved in Britain. In the entire cardiovascular area, only one drug was approved uh, in the five-year period from 67 to 72. Um, and this can be correlated with known organizational problems at FDA. These carts are taking to an FDA official the documents required to get just one drug approved. Well, hi there. Must be the new one they called me about. It took six years' work by the drug company to get this okay. drug passed. Take this one right here. All 119 volumes. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. The implications for the patients are that therapeutic decisions that used to be the preserve of the doctor and the patient are increasingly becoming made at a national level by committees of experts. And these committees and the agency for whom they are acting, the FDA, are highly skewed towards avoiding risks. So there's a tendency for us to have drugs that are safer, but not to have drugs that are effective. Uh, now, I've heard some remarkable statements from some of these advisory committees in considering drugs. Uh, one has seen the statement, there are not enough patients with a disease of this severity to warrant marketing this drug for general use. Now, that's fine if what you're trying to do is to minimize drug toxicity for the whole population. But if you happen to be one of these not enough patients uh, and you have a disease that is of high severity or disease that's very rare, then that's just tough luck on you. For 10 years, Mrs. Esther Usdane suffered from severe asthma. The medication she received had serious side effects. Her condition was getting worse, but the drug her doctor preferred was prohibited by the FDA. So twice a year, Mrs. Usdane had to set out on a journey. The drug her doctor wanted her to have had been available for use for five years in Canada. Once across the border at Niagara Falls, Mrs. Usdane could make use of a prescription that she'd obtained from a Canadian doctor. All she had to do was go to any pharmacy. There she could buy the drug that was totally prohibited in her own country. The drug worked immediately. It was easy for Mrs. Usdane to get around the FDA regulations because she happens to live near the Canadian border. Not everyone is so lucky. It's no accident that, despite the best of intentions, the Food and Drug Administration operates so as to discourage the development and prevent the marketing of new and potentially useful drugs. Put yourself in the position of a bureaucrat who works over there. Suppose you approve a drug that turns out to be dangerous, a thalidomide. Your name is going to be on the front page of every newspaper. You will be in deep disgrace. On the other hand, suppose you make the mistake of failing to approve a drug that could have saved thousands of lives. Who will know? The people whose lives might have been saved will not be around. Their relatives are unlikely to know that there was something that could have saved their lives. A few doctors, a few research workers, they will be disgruntled, they will know. You or I, if we were in the position of that bureaucrat, would behave exactly the same way. Our 
own interest would demand that we take any chance whatsoever, almost, of refusing to approve a good drug in order to be sure that we never approve a bad one. Drug companies can no longer afford to develop new drugs in the United States for patients with rare diseases. Increasingly, they must rely on drugs with high volume sales. Four drug firms have already gone out of business, and the number of new drugs introduced is going down. And where will it all lead? We simply haven't learned from experience. Remember Prohibition? In a burst of moral righteousness at the end of the First World War, when many young men were overseas, the non-drinkers imposed on all of us prohibition of alcohol. They did it for our own good. And there is no doubt that alcohol is a dangerous substance. Unquestionably, more lives are lost each year through alcohol and also the smoking of cigarettes than through all the dangerous substances that the FDA controls. But where did it lead? This place is today a legitimate business. It's the oldest bar in Chicago, but during Prohibition days, it was a speakeasy. Al Capone, Bugs Moran, many of the other gangsters of the day sat around this very bar planning the exploits that made them so notorious. Murder, extortion, hijacking, bootlegging. Who were the customers who came here? They were people who regarded themselves as respectable individuals who would never have approved of the activities that Al Capone and Moran were engaged in. They wanted a drink, but in order to have a drink, they had to break the law. Prohibition didn't stop drinking, but it did convert a lot of otherwise law-obedient citizens into lawbreakers. Fortunately, we're a very long way from that today with the prohibition on cyclamate and DDT. But make no mistake about it, there is already something of a gray market in drugs that are prohibited by the FDA. Many a conscientious physician feels himself in a dilemma, caught between what he regards as the welfare of his patient and strict obedience to the law. If we continue down this path, there is no doubt where it will end. After all, if it is appropriate for the government to protect us from using dangerous cap guns and bicycles, the logic calls for prohibiting still more dangerous activities such as hang gliding, motorcycling, skiing. If the government is to protect us from ingesting dangerous substances, the logic calls for prohibiting alcohol and tobacco. Even the people who administer the regulatory agencies are appalled at this prospect and withdraw from it. As for the rest of us, we want no part of it. Let the government give us information, but let us decide for ourselves what chances we want to take with our own lives. As you can see, all sorts of silly things happen when government starts to regulate our lives, setting up agencies to tell us what we can buy, what we can't buy, what we can do. Remember, we started out this program with a Corvair, an automobile that was castigated by Ralph Nader as unsafe at any speed. The reaction to his crusade led to the establishment of a whole series of agencies designed to protect us from ourselves. Well, some 10 years later, one of the agencies that was set up in response to that uh, move finally got around to testing the Corvair that started the whole thing off. And what do you suppose they found? They spent a year and a half comparing the performance of the Corvair with the performance of other comparable vehicles. And they concluded, and I quote, the 1960-63 Corvair compared favorably with the other contemporary vehicles used in the tests. Nowadays, there are Corvair fan clubs throughout the country. Corvairs have become collector's items. Consumers have given their verdict on Ralph Nader and the government regulations. As Abraham Lincoln said, you can't fool all of the people all of the time. It's time all of us stop being fooled by those well-meaning bureaucrats who claim to protect us because they say we can't protect ourselves. The men and women who have fostered this movement have been sincere. They believe 
that we as consumers are not able to protect ourselves, that we need the help of a wise and beneficent government. But as so often happened, the results have been very different from the intentions. Not only have our pockets been picked of billions of dollars, but also we are left less well protected than we were before. Well, that's quite a claim and one that I imagine will be bitterly contested by many consumers' advocates who believe that the ordinary people, consumers, do need to be protected by law and by governments from their own ignorance, from their own impatience, perhaps even from their own folly, from the possibility of exploitation or abuse by unscrupulous or irresponsible commerce and industry. And in a moment, I want to bring in our panel of Roy Hattersley, Saxon Tate, and Charles Medawar. But first, Professor Friedman, could I ask you a couple, bring up a couple of points with you? One on the logic of the film. It seems to me there that you've produced evidence, um, whether or not decisive, that there are costs and hazards attached to the process of trying to protect the consumer through law and through government. But for your claim at the end that we are worse off than we were before and that uh, your implied claim that uh, the consumer is better protected by natural market forces than he would be by all this apparatus, for that to be valid, you've got to show that those costs, those hazards are greater than the costs and hazards that would be attached to having no protection at all. And it didn't seem to me that you produced evidence to make that comparative judgment. Well, you have to look at, uh, uh, if you look at the evidence in the film, the prevention of new drugs, the fact that you people here in Britain have done a far better job so far. Under protection. Uh, under protection, but protection that has not been carried anything like so far as it has in the United States. Unfortunately, I have the impression that you're proceeding down the same road, that instead of learning from our mistakes, Britain is getting all set to repeat. But if you look at the situation that existed without the consumer protection, you do need a, a pattern of law of responsibility to protect the consumer. The state has a very real function to play in this. I don't want to say it uh, has none. The function of the state is to require people to be responsible for what they do. If you take, for example, the thalidomide case, the companies in Britain and in Germany that uh, produced the thalidomide bore enormously heavy expenses as a result of the compensation which they had to pay to the victims. If you go back to a much earlier episode, the episode that really started in America, the consumer protection movement in food and drugs uh, on a higher scale, it was the elixir sulfonilamide case of the 1930s, in which it was just after sulfonilamide, the first of the miracle drugs had been discovered. Uh, it was difficult for some people to take the solid form and a chemist uh, decided that he could uh, make it into a, a, a solution uh, by adding, I've forgotten what the uh, solvent was. The solvent turned out to be deadly. Now, one of the interesting things is that among the casualties of that was the chemist who did it who committed suicide. Now, those are very, very strong incentives for private enterprise to avoid uh, activities of a kind which are going to have those costs. There will be mistakes. You cannot have a perfect world. There is no way in which you can develop new products, in which you can develop new medicines, anything you talk about, without there being some occasions in which they're going to go wrong. Pursue the question of drugs in a moment, but I'd like to be as clear as possible about precisely what it is that you will tolerate and what you will not tolerate. I take it that you are a very strong believer in having effective laws against monopoly and effective enforcement of that. Now that involves an act of government or of Absolutely. the legislature. It also involves enforcing officers. You have a huge bureaucracy in the Department of Justice in the United States enforcing that law. Why, if it's acceptable to have those risks in enforcing anti-monopoly law in order that there should be competition to protect the consumer in that way, is it not acceptable that one should have some bureaucratic costs and some bureaucratic uh, miscarriages in order to protect the consumer in terms of product quality and safety? because there's a fundamental difference. I am in favor of anti-monopoly laws which gives the consumer greater, greater freedom to choose. The trouble with monopoly is that it limits choice. And laws which widen the range of consumer choice are all to the consumer's benefit. Therefore, I am in favor, not of all the things that are called anti-monopoly laws, because some of the things that are called anti-monopoly laws are not, but I am in favor of laws 
uh, which make contracts and restraint of trade unenforceable in the courts. The most effective anti-monopoly law of all is one we've already discussed on the, in this series. That's free trade, international competition. But the fundamental difference is between those actions, those measures of government, which protect consumers in their freedom of choice, and those which limit choice by substituting the judgment of bureaucrats for the judgments of individuals serving their own interest. Well, I'd like to bring in our panel now and come first to Charles Medua. Most of the evidence, naturally enough, uh, given in the film was based on American experience. How far do you think that experience uh, enables us to draw valid lessons for Britain because you work in this field? Well, on the basis of the film, it's, it's, it's uh, very difficult to know what comparison to make because the film did tr attempt to construct a general rule by looking at a number of exceptions. Um, it did confuse what, is consum what consumer protection is about with what government tends to do, and certainly there are exceptions to the general rule. Um, and I think over and uh, beyond that, it uh, totally overlooked the point that a good deal of government regulation has arisen in connection with the failure of manufacturers to, or producers to observe elementary responsibilities. But there's another reason why I don't think the comparison is easily drawn on the basis of what we've seen in the film. And that is that I think the whole free market argument is, uh, it, it, it quite misunderstands what the consumer movement is about. I don't think the consumer movement is actually about the quality of products as an end in itself. I think it's m much more about the quality of life. And it seems to me that the argument you put forward is one which is so depressing, so it is such a barren one. Um, it um, suggests that consumers are simply economic, m economic uh, e elementary economic units rather than actually people who do admittedly get satisfactions out of products. But much more than that, they have um, a, re a, a social relationship with, um, uh, with products which is never going to be satisfied by making products you know, bigger, better, as you have suggested. Well, I have to say, you had, after all, political responsibility for consumer protection as well as for prices, which is not the, our subject today. Traditionally, the Labour Party has always been much more interested in people as producers, as workers, than it has as consumers. It's only comparatively recently that consumer protection has moved up the political agenda as a, a, a major item. Why, apart from political opportunism, have uh, you and your <laughs> colleagues uh, moved in that direction, perhaps <laughs> under pressure from Mr. Medawar and his well, I fellow think advocates? For some of us, and probably Professor Friedman would agree at least with this, we find the distinction between producers and consumers a very arbitrary distinction and the interest of both groups ought to be solved simultaneously if you organize the economy properly. And I think when we've tried to pursue the interests of both groups, many of us have wanted to begin where Professor Friedman began, by saying that the best way to satisfy the needs of the whole economy, and certainly the best way of satisfying the needs of the consumer, is to produce the perfectly competitive situation. Our only reservation about doing that is that it's impossible and I wondered if I could pursue Professor Friedman on this very point. If he and I agree that the most efficient productive unit is likely to be the most competitive one, doesn't he share the view that increasingly with economies of scale making production much larger than it was, in many of the bogus examples we saw in the film, the only way one promotes and encourages and protects competition is by the government doing more and more to bring the conditions of competition about. Not simply a number of firms competing with each other, but a number of other ingredients of competition. I think it's Alfred Marshall who says perfect competition requires perfect knowledge, and only government can provide that these days. The difficulty with that argument, the gov government can provide perfect knowledge? <laughs> where are those perfect civil servants? The difficulty with the argument is twofold. Well, where's that perfect competition? I, mean, Marshall I agree, is there, is not, there is not perfect competition. The difficulty with this argument is precisely what came out in your comments first. We must compare competition as it actually is with government as it actually is, or else competition as it might be with government as it might be. It completely distorts the terms of the argument to compare competition as it is with government as it might be. Now, when we get down to the facts of the cases, far from government activity promoting competition, the major source of monopoly in your country and in my country is the intervention of governments. Take the FDA. The FDA has driven out of business small companies producing pharmaceuticals because it's too expensive now to get a drug approved. Instead of some 10 years or so ago, it cost a, 
$500,000 to get a drug approved. Now it costs $25 million. Only the large companies can afford to do it. In, in railroads, in trucking, where we talked about the ICC, there is no doubt that you could have perfect competition in trucking. Absolutely no reason, no technical reason. The only reason we don't have perfect competition in trucking in the United States is because of Interstate Commerce Commission. If you look at, I challenge you to find an area of monopoly where government has not been the major source of that monopoly. I want to go back to what Mr. Medawar said. Mr. Tate, we'll give us one in a minute. The British sugar industry. Well, I want to know. Very, very short. We'll come to him, but Mr. <laughs> I want to go back to what Mr. Medawar said, because of course people, I don't regard people solely as economic people at all. The, the real problem is a quality of life. I quite agree with you. And I regard it as a serious, uh, a serious interruption in my quality of life to have some civil servants sitting in Washington telling me what I may and may not do. Mr. Tate, you run a real life company. It produces sugar. It's a very famous company. Do you think that the consumer, or to what extent do you think that the consumer needs protection other than the protection of the natural forces of the marketplace? Well, <clears throat> I, I think the uh, consumer needs protection from the sort of legislation that we've had to put up with in the common market. As far as I'm concerned, um, my company reached what might be called a monopoly through straight efficiency. And this was before uh, we entered the common market. Now we're part of Europe. We enjoy some 12.5% of the sugar market. The regulations made by Brussels dictate the price we must pay for our raw material and dictate what we can sell our output for. It disadvantages us against uh, European grown material by about 20 pounds a ton. The result of this has been that over 2,000 jobs have been lost in my company over the past three years. And quite apart from the loss of those jobs, the price of sugar has gone up in the shops. And the cost to the British taxpayer of the common agricultural policy with regard only to sugar has been some 73 million pounds in 1979 alone. Well, now, Mr. Hattersley will correct me if I'm wrong, because he's an enthusiast about Europe. But as I understand those regulations... Oh, regula I am too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> as I understand those regulations, they're not aimed, in theory, at protecting the consumer in the sense that we're talking about here. They're aimed at helping and protecting the farmer. Whether or not they achieve that is another matter. W when it comes... Sorry, Mr. Yeah, I, well, I've got to say, I'm an enthusiast for Europe, but I'm not an enthusiast for the common agricultural policy, which, as you rightly say, is supposed to disadvantage the consumer. It's a farmer's cartel, which is intended to do all the things about competition, which I don't want to see happen. But you see what happens here. You want to have, as I uh, put it once, you want to have a cat that barks. You want to have a, you want to have an, a governmental agency that will behave like a non-governmental agency. If you have a governmental agency taking responsibility for these things, it's going to do all the things that you don't want them to do. It may do a few of the things you want them to do. But, say more but it's part of the same, it's part of the natural laws. Of, there are laws of social science just as they are of physical science. When you get a, set up a governmental agency, it follows laws of its own, well, and it does things a, you don't approve of. Let's look at a real cat in a real world. A situation okay, in which... A, see a, whether a, he can a, well, well, to see what, what you want the cat to do. Right. Um, a company which has grown to become a monopoly, either for reasons of efficiency or for reasons of simple power and strength and other things. I draw no moral conclusion from that. I describe it as a fact. I think we both agree that because it's become that monopoly, it can do a number of things which both of us would regard as undesirable. It can protect itself from competitors coming in by high levels of advertising. It can increase its price unreasonably. Now, are you really saying, Chris Friedman, as you shake your head, that if a company behaves like that, all the new entrepreneurs of famous fiction would suddenly arise and set up competitors? Because I can give you a dozen examples where that hasn't happened. Let me How give do you a make that company give you more competitive. Let me tell you, very easy, by free trade. There are lots of sugar producers all over the world. Uh, Tate uh, and Lyle has no monopoly in the world market. What fraction of the world market are you? Municipal, um, tiny, but minuscule. Uh, not min minuscule. <laughs> but let, let me give you an example where what you say exactly has happened. Uh, our Canadian subsidiary, Red Path Industries, uh, enjoyed some 30 plus percent of the northeastern market of Canada. Uh, there were three companies in that market for many, many years, and um, there was a degree of collusion well before my time, and we were taken to court 
and we were found wanting, and we did often un operate under a prohibition order. Nevertheless, the three companies, without even speaking to each other, could maintain a margin. What happened? Two more sugar refiners have recently appeared, and that the least efficient plant, which happens to be one of ours, has recently had to close. I'd like to ask Mr. Medow whether from his work he could give us uh, some perhaps rather concrete examples of things which would be familiar to people in the consumer area of where uh, there are product problems arising which were successfully or are perhaps in process of being successfully tracked down by some kind of specialist or professional agency where you couldn't reasonably expect the consumer within a reasonable time scale or indeed the competitors of that manufacturer to have uh, protected the consumer. Okay, the, ob the, the, the obvious example is drugs. About 15 years ago in this country, the Sainsbury Committee looked into the relationship between the, the pharmaceutical industry and the National Health Service. And one of the exercises they did was to look at the quality of drugs on the market. They had two independent panels looking at them, and they found that 35% of all the drugs um, were unacceptable for one reason or another. Normally, the risks outweighed the benefits. They were inefficient, or they represented irrational combinations. Um, that, incidentally, prompted um, the Medicines Act of 1968, which is an example of government intervention following irresponsibility on the, part of, on, on, on the part of manufacturers. Now, here's a clear example where, first of all, first because you don't have aggregated information about the way patients react to, this, uh, uh, to, to these drugs, you don't have the perfect information. Secondly, the expertise of the you patient... Mean the ordinary consumer doesn't have the information? Well, nobody has it. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, in fact, the systems for getting together information about... Um, unquantifiable loss, social damage and so on, just, just isn't there. Um, over and above that, it's quite clear that the complexity of the drugs, the mechanisms by which they work, can be at best understood by doctors, um, but even doctors were being persuaded by the promotional methods used by the drug companies to actually prescribe 35% of useless drugs. Is it surprising that government intervention is necessary to protect the consumer? Uh, I take like it that? the promotional techniques of government are harmless? <laughs> How do you mean, the promotional? Well, I think the uh, biggest propagandists in the world today are governments. How many public relations agents... Uh, but you're not answering agents. my question. My question no, no, is, I'm getting is... to you. Again, the question is always mm. not perfection versus perfection, mm. but an imperfect world of one kind versus an imperfect world of another. Now, if you take the case you're talking about, in the first place, the market offers means for solving your kind of a problem. Uh, that is, or uh, testing organizations. Industry has its own testing organizations, which do test products and provide information for a fee about their quality. In the United States, there are two such consumer testing organizations, Consumers Research and Consumers Union. N neither of whom, it, neither of whom have a very to... large audience because the consumer doesn't want to buy it. But look, e audience or not, they couldn't possibly be expected to undertake the responsibility which had been... Um, uh, left aside by manufacturers to test, to evaluate, to disseminate information about a body of 3,000 drugs, a third of which were useless. They do exactly that. They, they do, put they... out a great big fat book once a year, a buying guide, yes, I and know, monthly I know well. publications, in which they examine and evaluate an enormous variety, and if... I'm sorry, if, Professor if Friedman, you're quite wrong, because if these are ethical con products. These are drugs more... that are prescribed through doctors and not available directly to consumers. There is not a consumer organization in the world that has done any systematic evaluation of such drugs. Perhaps not. I was talking of the drugs that, were per, uh, that you could buy at the drugstore, uh, which consumers can buy directly. So far as physicians are concerned, it's the Mayo Clinics, it's the... Uh, uh, hospitals, it's the organizations of physicians which can privately provide similar kind of services. It's the American Medical Association. Uh, uh, and that is exactly what had happened between the time when drugs were more likely to kill you than cure you at the turn of the century to say the mid-sixties when um, using all the mechanisms you describe or using them far more than government intervention drugs were still largely useless or, or a third of them were absolutely useless. The great, the great advance in the miracle drugs in the 1960s will probably never again be possible, precisely because it's been cut off at the source. I've talked to some of the people who are involved in developing the miracle drugs, and they say under present regulatory conditions, you will never get those drugs. In the United States, new drugs used to be 75% produced by American companies and 25% from abroad. Today, new drug development has been driven abroad. 25% of the new drugs are from home, 
and 75% from abroad. Well, I, have the yes, I, I, I was anxious not to pursue the drug. I, I think it's so unfair to press a Friedman's case, but he's so anxious to do it. Let me ask him what he <laughs> tells me really happens. If there's no regulation, no state regulation, uh, what are the checks on the reckless development of drugs? Is he saying uh, that other companies expose the reckless development? Is he saying that my constituents, would it personally, are supposed to find out whether the drug kills them or cures them. Is he saying that doctors make the decision? What is the form of regulation the if form he didn't of, say? The form of regulation is that, uh, you see, one of the interesting phenomena, this goes back to the sugar case, is that private enterprises and their private activities have a much longer view and a much longer horizon than governments have. Governments can never look forward beyond the next election. As a result... That showbiz, I mean... It, I'm no, no, no. I'm going on to try to bring it directly to your point. As a result, an enterprise, a sugar enterprise or a pharmaceutical enterprise, has a great interest in establishing a goodwill, in having a consumer recognition. If you take cases in which mistakes have happened, and I can give you some cases, companies which have made mistakes, have accidentally put out something which was dangerous, have gone bankrupt and gone out of business. And therefore, it's a simple, good business of establishing and keeping goodwill. But what if that they is the primary the mistakes that yeah. they make? What What's if that? they can disguise the mistakes they make? I mean, they will it... try to disguise the mistakes they make, and, of course. And very, very often succeed. They can very but often this is part, succeed. It seems, they of... can very often succeed. But if they fail, but as they will inevitably in a fraction of the case. But so long as greed motivates the, the economy what motivates, or society. Excuse me, what motivates right. the government officials? Well, is it something other than greed? You were, suge you were suggesting that the role of government, ideally, should be to keep the road clear for human Absolutely. greed and self-interest to promote the welfare of the consumer. Right. So long as that situation persists, it is absolutely natural that producers will, will disguise evidence of their failings, will externalize their costs and allow other people to suffer where, um, when, when they slip up deliberately or otherwise, when they cut corners. That they will it naturally also, tend to that model. Of course, but it is also natural that their competitors will try to expose their no, failures. No, no, no. There are unwritten agreements. There is no knocking copy in advertising. There is. You, haven't been, you haven't been watching American advertising recently in which it's all named other products that are attacked Professor, and not product A. Because, as you know, I live in the United States, and the, the development of knocking copy in uh, uh, American advertising, which is now very visible and remarkable, has to some extent come about as a result of legal intervention by the government authorities to prevent this conspiracy, as you would have regarded yes. it, as I would have regarded it, preventing it. So that is, in a way, an example of government bestirring itself. And it brings me to the question I wanted to ask you, which is, for example, you have a law in the United States, Truth in Advertising which um, is a specific law with specific enforcement uh, agents to prevent people, roughly speaking, marketing, advertising a product, product by making false claims. Now, that extends the consumer's choice in the sense that he has more reliable information. Do you approve of that? Yes. And let me give you another example on safety. Um, this is on the practicality from the consumer's point of view. Uh, you'll recall that the DC-10 had some problems and was for a while grounded in the United States. Yes. Uh, I think it was last summer. I was due to make a journey in one three days after it was grounded. Uh, I didn't know whether or not I would be able to do it. On the day that I was due to fly, the particular aircraft in which I was going to fly was cleared by the uh, FAA as being safe. I flew in it. I completed my journey successfully. I couldn't possibly have made that judgment three days later. If it had been left to me, I would have to either said, I'll never fly in a DC-10 again, uh, or, I'm, or I'm just going to risk it. There's well, no way I that I'm you, not an I, I think you made a mistake. You should not fly in the DC-10 very <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> but in that case, you're inviting people to make very crude judgments. I mean, any, a plane but, crashes, uh, but, but, you never uh, use it again. Yes, but note, note what the situation is. If the government approves, uh, this goes back very far. This is a case that was discussed by A.V. Dicey back in his great book about the Plimsoll line for ships. Mm. And it's the same point. If the government approves a plane and says it's safe, the people who then fly that plane and use it are protected from damage suits. But if, if it then crashes, if the government has made a mistake, we have a very good case of that in cigarettes. Here we have cigarettes in which the fact that the government requires the manufacturers to put on their American cigarettes, smoking this may be dangerous to your health, has left the cigarette companies free from damage suits because it might have caused harm. Now, I, I want to ask, incidentally, I want to ask this consumer advocate a question. If you really are, believe in protecting the consumer from himself, 
Are you in favour of prohibiting alcohol in cigarettes? No, look, I don't believe in protecting the consumer from, him, from himself. I believe in protecting the consumer from greedy people who will willingly, cleverly and very easily take advantage of consumers. And those in, are two including totally those who are infinitely greater than his by their nature and by their organisation and whose powers are infinitely greater than the consumers. You're talking about the government officials? No, of course I'm not. I'm talking about the company. Now, it may well be that you can produce examples, and I'm sure you can, of government officials for being all the things that uh, the film implied incompetent, foolish, bureaucratic, corrupt. But there's a supposition that some of them might at least be considering these matters objectively. I think it's much more difficult to make that supposition about a company which, on your analysis, the greed analysis, wants to sell its products. We're and all of us. We're all of us. Just to take, to take anything a company, they are. Just to take a company put in uh, a little bit about the FDA here. And the FDA here, as, to me, is extremely beneficial. It protects me, and it is an excellent marketing tool, as well as sugar, which we're you, best you, known you're for. You're talking about the FDA, you're talking about the American Food and Drug Administration. Yes, I am. As well as uh, doing sugar and sweeteners, we do a variety of processes and chemicals for a variety of uses. I haven't met one yet that uh, took $25 million worth of testing, but something between 5 and $7 million is not unusual. Once it is tested, um, we feel um, protected. No two ways about that. And Tate and Lyle, as a company which is offering uh, food, could not stand um, not to have that sort of protection. If the FDA weren't there, private, enter private enterprise would have to provide the testing facilities. Can I now, uh, will, you, will you please mm. let me finish? Mm. When we have got that protection, we sell our processes and our chemicals all over the world. And one of the things that sells them is FDA approval. <laughs> I, I want to put a final question to, to, to Roy Hatsley and perhaps turn the tables a little bit back on him. Whether or not <laughs> Professor Friedman is right that we'd be better off uh, if we had only the kind of protection he talks about and protection of market forces. Isn't there probably some truth in the accusation that we, particularly in Britain, perhaps because we have a rather uh, aristocratic tradition of government or for whatever reason built into our culture, tend to say that where a need is shown, for example, that there is a danger of a product reaching the public which would be dangerous or unsafe, we tend to go from establishing the need almost automatically to saying, well, then the government should do it. And we tend not to weigh into the balance what are the costs, the risks uh, which are involved uh, in that process? What are the dangers that the bureaucrats may uh, uh, make mistakes, that the politicians may be motivated by things other than pure truth, that um, we shall deprive the public of other things which would be advantageous to them, i.e. that we tend almost automatically to assume that once the need is shown, then government should act and government will act cost-free and perfectly. Isn't there some truth no, in that? No, I don't believe there is. I mean, that's a common view of Britain as uh, represented by a couple of television companies. But I don't believe it's how Britain is organised at all. I mean, on the evidence, our competition legislation, which is regarded as damaging to industry sometimes and expensive to industry, is weaker than almost every other competition <laughs> policy in the, the Western world. If the film we've seen is anything other than a collection of very biased examples, our consumer protection is nothing like the extent of the consumer protection in the United States. It isn't, you're and, quite right. And, or even if it is a lot of biased examples. Uh, and it isn't a lot of biased examples. It's perfectly representative. No, you're quite right. But it you're, was, it, well, you're quite right. It was four biased examples. But, it, but it was quite. You're quite right that, that Britain has not gone and as the, far as we very, have. There are very many other examples where Britain intervention. Let's take price, which you don't want to talk about, but is very much related to today. I mean, our prices policy, even when we had it at what the height of the Labour government of three or four years ago, it was nothing like the prices policy that was operated in France, where ministers could, by edict, hold down prices individually. I think it's simply a misunderstanding of how government is organised in Britain to describe it as it is. When you sat round the cabinet table with your, with your colleagues, did you often find yourself saying to one another, well, in theory, that would be a good idea, but if it's left to us and our officials were bound to file it up, so let's not do it. <laughs> no, I don't think we ever did. I think we, took the, I think we took the John Stuart Mill view that theory and practice ought to coincide and we never tried to make the distinction between... But that between leads the to a presumption that because the theory is right in a particular case, the practice will coincide whether or not no, the evidence No, I think we took the view that, that the, the, the practice had to work to make the theory worth discussing. I think there were very many occasions when we said in an ideal world, this is what we'd like to happen, but it's not within the powers of government and certainly not within the powers of industry to bring it about. I think we were a very pragmatic government. I think uh, 
the, the, the pragmatism of a government one of its abiding features. And I think it will be eventually the abiding feature of this government when it shakes itself down and begins to face reality. Indeed, my objection to much of what Professor Friedman has represented today is that it is so unpractical, that it is so concerned with theory, that it is so concerned with the scheme, which in every example everyone's given him today has proved to be Un, uh, untypical of what goes on in the real world. My complaint about his entire theory is that it is a theory and not a practice. Excuse me, Mr. Tate. Confirmed that what I was saying was realistic about the sugar industry. Uh, you have confirmed that it's realistic about the government industry. Uh, Mr. Medawar has confirmed by what he was saying that it was realistic about the consumer protection industry. The I consumer protection I sense the disagreement, an almost complete disagreement between us. The consumer protection and industry in this country is not protecting the consumer against tariffs. What was shown in the film is realistic and exactly what is happening in the United States. We have in the United States decontrolled to a considerable extent airlines. Uh, thank very much to help from, from uh, uh, Laker. Laker. We, and that has been extremely beneficial to consumers. We are now having a big argument about decontrolling railroads and trucks, and that's going to lose, unfortunately, because of the political power of the truckers who do not want to be decontrolled. The, uh, what is shown in that film is entirely realistic, describes not only what is happening in the United States, but unfortunately, the direction in which you and Britain are going. But the question is whether you and Britain will learn from this kind of thing and move in a different direction or whether you will insist in imitating our mistakes. But the example you gave of the truckers is really nothing to do with consumer protection at all unless we accept your assertion that what starts off in an industry to be consumer protection eventually turns out to be protection of the employers of course, and the industry. Of and I think we can give you some examples of where consumer protection has continued to maintain its proper intention. I won't say its proper function, you take ex exception to that description, but its initial intention. If we could give you examples in the dying second of the program of consumer protection which has not simply allowed the cartel to justify itself or become respectable, would you support consumer protection then if such examples existed? The question is whether those examples are special or typical. Obviously, in the course of doing a hundred things, one or two or three of them are going to work out right. I'm not going to say that uh, there are no uh, elements of goodness in a, in a uh, direction that is generally bad. But what you would have to do is do more than give me one or two examples. You would have to show me that there is something about the process in the system which gives the governmental officials who are in charge an incentive in general to act in a way which is advantageous to consumers. My argument has been really that it's in the self-interest of governmental officials to act in a way which is disadvantageous to consumers when they undertake, in the name of consumer protection, to do the kind of things they do. And you think that film demonstrated that? I think that film illustrates it. It doesn't demonstrate it, but it does illustrate it. Professor Friedman. Roy Hattersley, Mr. Tate, Mr. Medler, thank you very much indeed. Well, that's it for this week. We hope we'll see